This tornado looks so surreal. It looks like something straight from a movie. But you're looking at actual footage of the only F5 tornado to ever hit the country of Canada. Which, fun fact, is the second most tornado prone country in the world. It's gotten bigger and it's still on the ground and there's debris being kicked up now. I can hear it. Yep. It's, I think it's hitting the town. This crazy 2007 twister was so weird on so many levels. For starters, it stands as one of the thinnest F5 tornadoes in recorded history, with a width of only about 150 yards. For comparison, most F5 or EF5s look like this, or this. No wonder experts had to argue about whether to rate this funnel F4 or F5. But that's not all. Unlike typical tornado tracks that move in a fairly straight line, this one went rogue, doing three full loops and a series of sharp, unpredictable curves. It even doubled back to hit the same homes twice. It crept along at a speed of only 10 miles per hour. Professional marathon runners would be faster. And the odd, miraculous part Despite the fact that it obliterated houses in seconds, tossed vehicles like toys, and left entire structures scrubbed from their foundations, not a single person was injured or killed. You could say this was the most Canadian way an F5 tornado could have happened. Powerful, chaotic, but polite enough to leave everyone unharmed. Those are just the tip of the interesting details about the 2007 Eli Twister. Because as this video unfolds, it's only going to get more unbelievable. The tornado touched down near Eli at approximately 6.25 p.m. on this day in 2007. Its top wind speed was estimated to be between 430 and 510 kilometers per hour. Since the first F5 tornado in Canadian history touched down right here in Manitoba. Eli, Manitoba is a tiny prairie town located about 40 kilometers west of Winnipeg. Back in 2007, the town had a population of just around a thousand people. Safe to say, it was the kind of quiet community where not much happens. People probably didn't expect the weather to make headlines, let alone permanent history. Friday, June 22nd, 2007. Started like any typical summer day for the Eli locals. Bright, humid, the kind of sticky heat where you step outside and instantly regret the first few minutes. But as the day went on, and the sun started its slow descent, things took a turn. The skies began to darken, clouds thickened, and an uneasy stillness started to settle in. To the average person, it just looked like a regular storm was brewing. But here's what was actually happening in the atmosphere. A meteorological cocktail for disaster. June 22nd, 2007. The hot, humid weather might have felt like the opposite of bad weather to most people. But scientifically speaking, it was actually the perfect setup for severe storms. Since the temperature soared into the 90s Fahrenheit, mid-30s Celsius, and the dew points were stuck in the 70s, thick, soupy air was just lingering. And in the world of tornadoes, that's a loaded atmosphere unstable, primed, and just waiting for a trigger. Now add a jet stream, which was the fast-moving river of air way up in the atmosphere, blowing in from Saskatchewan. That was the source of wind shear, the factor that helps storms tilt, twist, and organize themselves into rotating monsters. Meanwhile, at the surface, a low-pressure system was pulling in air like a giant atmospheric vacuum. That creates lift, pushing all that warm, moist air upward. And the map just got busier. A warm front just north of Eli 
funneled in more humid air. A cold front sat to the west near Lake Manitoba, which helped shove that warm air upward. And then the wild card, a lake breeze boundary lurking just south of Lake Manitoba. That boundary acted like a trigger, a collision zone between cool lake air and warm, unstable land air. It had the ingredients to spark a tornado at any moment. But here's the twist. A cap was in place, keeping it all bottled up. Not a baseball cap, a weather cap, a layer of warm, dry air a few thousand feet up that acts like a lid, stopping storms from forming too early. Usually, a cap keeps everything bottled up, but if something manages to break through, like that sneaky lake breeze mentioned earlier, storms can explode upwards in minutes. And that's exactly what happened. By 5 p.m., storms began to pop up. 40 minutes later, two supercells had formed just northwest of Eli, and a third popped up in the southwest. Another 40 minutes after that, small, thin funnels began to dip down and pull back up, briefly teasing the ground like a yo-yo. But at 6.25 p.m., a long, roping funnel extended from a wall cloud and made solid contact with the ground. This time, it was the real deal. The tornado made its official touchdown just north of the Trans-Canada Highway, northwest of the main part of Eli. No rain wall, no haze, no dramatic lightning show. The funnel was completely visible right from the start, clear, rope-like, and oddly peaceful. In fact, it didn't cause too much panic at first. For storm chasers like Justin Hobson, this was awe-inspiring. He's been chasing storms for two years straight, but this was the first tornado he had ever seen in person. He described the moment as eerily calm. A tornado on the ground, I've been videotaping for 10 minutes already. I like to say that it has gotten bigger and it's still on the ground and it's getting definitely closer but moving very slowly. Birds were chirping, mosquitoes were buzzing, low rumbles of thunder rolled through the background, but then chaos. After touchdown, the tornado moved southeast, which was already a red flag. Most tornadoes in North America move from southwest to northeast. This one, it did the exact opposite, and it didn't just go in a straight line either. Just before crossing the highway, it veered east, briefly tracking parallel to the road, and then took a sudden hard turn south the first of its many weird curves. At this stage, it was rated around EF1 intensity, which was already enough to toss a semi-truck like a toy. The driver, probably traumatized, but unharmed. After crossing the highway, the tornado moved east again, mirroring the road, then zigzagged into the town's flour mill, a key business in Eli. You'd think it would just keep heading east after that. But no, this is where the tornado made its first full loop, circling counterclockwise and hitting the flour mill a second time. By now, it had strengthened to about EF2 intensity, with a width of 55 yards, about half the length of a football field. Walls were being blasted inward, Semi-trucks were flying around like Hot Wheels. Residents described the sound as a low, growling roar, like a waterfall that cranked to max volume. It's quite strong when it's windy or stormy. Not sure how long it took. It didn't seem that long, but next thing you know, everything was gone. And I don't remember my husband pulling the mattress over top of us, but... Um when he, he said, I think the house is gone, honey, and I go, I looked up and I could see the sky, and I think our luck was surviving an F5 tornado. The looped damage caused millions in destruction. But the twister wasn't done yet, and we hadn't even hit F5 strength. Still zigzagging, the tornado continued straight south, away from the highway. 
it briefly weakened, dipping down to EF0. But at the same time, its width tripled, expanding to 150 yards across. Moments later, it curved east again, but not in a clean arc. It bent slightly north and slammed into the southwest edge of Eli. Unfortunately, the twister didn't make a miraculous swerve this time. Just before impact, it intensified to F4, and what happened next was devastating. It struck a cluster of four homes on the town's edge. Not once, but twice. It made a scribble-like loop over the same area for about four minutes. Some of these homes were anchored to their foundations and still got completely shredded. All that was left was rubble. Trees were stripped of their bark. Cars were crushed flat or tossed hundreds of feet away. One car landed on a neighbor's rooftop. After that, the tornado curved into another counterclockwise loop in an open field just south of town, then drifted southwest. And finally, after nearly 40 minutes of erratic movement, it dissipated. Here's a rough illustration of the path it took. Now compare that to a typical tornado path, which usually looks like a straight or slightly arcing line. Incredibly different, aren't they? After 3.7 miles and 35 minutes on the ground, the tornado left behind several million dollars in damage. But incredibly, and thankfully, not a single person was injured or killed. The next day, officials and meteorologists began the process of surveying the damage and scientifically classifying the tornado. At this point in time, Canada was still using the original Fujita scale, even though the enhanced Fujita scale had already been adopted in the United States earlier that same year. The Fujita scale estimates a tornado's wind speed based on the type and severity of damage left behind. So, instead of directly measuring the wind, experts look at what was destroyed, and how badly, to reverse engineer how strong the winds must have been. Here's how the survey, or surveys, rather, went down in the field. The first survey team rolled into Eli the day after the tornado, June 23, 2007. Right away, they started inspecting what was left of the town's flour mill, a nearby farm about four kilometers northwest of town, and of course, the damage path in between. Most of the path was just open prairie, which made the whole surveying the damage thing tricky. No buildings meant no clear indicators of how intense the tornado really was. To make things harder, there wasn't time or budget for aerial footage at first. So it had to be done the old school way, ground surveys and conversations with locals. At that point, they landed on a preliminary rating of F4, pretty severe, but not historic. Still, something felt off. See, one of the four destroyed homes didn't just collapse, it was obliterated, like wiped clean off its foundation. However, there was a dilemma. The tornado moved incredibly slowly, just a few miles in over half an hour. So the question was, was it really that strong, or did it just linger, grinding the same houses down little by little? The team didn't want to rush to call it an F5. They knew that kind of label comes with heat, from the media, the science community, and everyone in between. And if you're wondering why, well, F5s or EF5s are extremely rare. You may have seen a couple in storm documentaries or Hollywood-style tornado montages, but on the bigger scale, they're basically the unicorns of severe weather. In all of recorded history, there have been fewer than 70 officially rated F5 or EF5 tornadoes. That's less than 0.1% of all tornadoes ever documented. Out of those, 59 touched down in the United States alone. The rest scattered across the globe. France and Germany have each logged two. Argentina, Australia, and Italy have one apiece. So, they played it safe, 
F4. But that was just a temporary label, one that wouldn't hold for long once the second wave of information about Eli rolled in. Over the following weeks, after the twister hit, a flood of videos and photos poured in, shot by storm chasers, residents, and even meteorologists who'd been out in the field that day. Two videos stood out. One was filmed from the south and showed the tornado's entire life cycle. The other came from the west, capturing the tornado's destruction of the homes and flour mill in real time. And with that, the game changed. Investigators started triangulating, matching GPS landmarks, camera angles, and timestamps to pin down exactly where the tornado was and when. This is when the tornado's path became clear for the first time. They saw the loops and curves, the wild, erratic path this tornado took, like it had a mind of its own. And those homes it ripped clean off their foundations, turns out they weren't battered for minutes on end like some suspected. Each one was struck for less than 30 seconds. That's all it took, half a minute for entire well-built houses to be reduced to splinters. So much for the slow grind theory. By now, it was obvious, this thing had power. Power that makes an F5 rating more plausible. Still, the team wasn't done. They launched a third and final survey, returning to the area with updated video analysis, drone photos, and GPS coordinates in hand. They went full detective mode, matching debris fields to video frames, measuring craters in the earth where vehicles had slammed down, and confirming how far and how fast things had flown. One cargo van had been picked up, hurled through the air, landed grill first in a deep depression, and then bounced 15 meters before settling. And just before it hit the four homes, the tornado widened then began to rope out, tightening and spinning faster, conserving angular momentum like a figure skater pulling into a spin. That final burst of energy might have been its most violent phase. And with all that stacked evidence, destruction, video proof, structural analysis, it was finally official. Eli Manitoba had just survived Canada's first ever F5 tornado.